The Federals pushed the Confederate Army and civilian authorities back to Texas in the New Mexico campaign, but the Confederates continued pretending that their version of Arizona still existed. Robert Jocelyn, serving as territorial secretary from abroad since the rebels were still in Arizona, surprisingly had a small but operational salaried government in exile in San Antonio from late 1862 until May of 1865. Then, late in 1864, after former military governor John Baylor was elected to the Confederate Congress as a representative for Texas, and without Jocelyn giving up his own post as Secretary of the Arizona Territory, Jocelyn appointed himself Acting Governor and also Indian Commissioner for the Yankee Occupied Territory. Meanwhile, Marcus McWillie shrewdly lobbied to keep his position as Delegate for the Arizona Territory in the Confederate Congress until the bitter end, and so he too drew a salary until the Confederate government fled from Richmond in April 1865. After Baylor's removal from the Army and the Governorship, Dr. Lewis Owings continued claiming the title of Provisional Governor of Arizona while in Texas for the rest of the war, but his government in exile was a one-man show. He still had his admirers who helped him keep the memory alive. Captain James Tevis of Tucson was deployed to Arkansas with the Arizona Cavalry Battalion in the 3rd Texas Arizona Cavalry in 1864 when he wrote to Governor Owings lamenting being so far east and itching to take the fight back to Arizona. Several other old faces from 1860 also wrote to the former governor, their governor, reminiscing over the good times and missing Arizona terribly while they were all deployed in the east. One such person who kept writing to Owens was Burdette Murray, the other co-editor of the Messiah Times, the one that Baylor didn't kill. Murray, the newsman, was now a private in the 3rd Texas Arizona Cavalry, who wrote in a letter to his governor, I am still very anxious to again visit Arizona. When three out of four regiments of the Arizona Brigade were deployed to Louisiana, Arkansas, and the Indian Territory in 1863, they were not happy about it. They followed orders and saw the necessity of keeping the Federals out of Texas since that was their staging ground to retake Arizona. 1864 came and the founding members of the Arizona Brigade were suffering in morale because they still hadn't been able to return to their territory. While many of the Brigade's volunteers were ruffians, prior deserters, and draft dodgers trying to stay west of the Mississippi, most of the Brigade's soldiers had specifically enlisted for service in Arizona. On February 14, 1864, there was a meeting of leading Arizona exiles at San Antonio's Menger Hotel, including Lieutenant Colonel Dan Showalter of the 4th Texas Arizona, Captain Granville Owry, and 12 other officers. The officers signed a letter to Lieutenant General Kirby Smith pitching the following plan. We propose to take 100 men under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Dan Showalter, traveling in detachments of 25 men through Mexico, for the ostensible purpose of visiting the late rich gold discovery made in the territory of Arizona. Then concentrate our forces at Tucson, take that place, and move directly forward to the gold mines between the headwaters of the Salinas and Gila rivers where we are assured that our numbers will be augmented to 500 men. Thence we march directly on Fort Yuma, destroy that point, and open communication with Southern California. It was quite a lofty plan, but it never came to fruition. To many of the men's outrage, the Arizona troops were once again sent to fight north and east of Texas. And by the following time next year, there wouldn't be 500 men in the whole Arizona Brigade, not to mention the $20,000 in gold that they'd asked for to fund the expedition. Three critical factors doomed the proposed expedition before it began. First, it was going to require $20,000 in gold specie that the Confederacy just didn't have that late in the war. The Confederate States was so desperate for money, they sent Captain Rufus Henry Ingram to raise a partisan ranger band in California to steal gold for the rebel war effort. Second, Showalter's intelligence was nearly two years old. A lot of the men from the area whom he spoke with while passing through northern Mexico were exiles. The Arizonans in exile, giving Showalter his information, underestimated how thoroughly Colonel Carleton purged Arizona of Confederate sympathizers. Third, the Federals launched the Red River Campaign, and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments were deployed again, with the 4th Regiment locked down to defend Texas. But Dan Showalter and Granville Ulrey were not the only ones scheming to reconquer Arizona in 1864. In late 1863, former Arizona militia commander under the provisional government, Palatine Robinson, joined efforts with former territorial secretary James Lucas to recruit volunteers for such an expedition. Texas Colonel David Terry, operating without the authorization of General Smith, 
was hard at work recruiting a brigade to take back the Southwest. David Terry was the former Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. He was also the guy who killed California's anti-slavery senator David Broderick during the sectional crisis, which totally was not the only political duel during that time. After his political and judicial career ended, Terry went back to Texas, and when the Civil War began, Terry became a Confederate officer. By 1864, the former Chief Justice had once again turned his sights on the Golden State. In authorizing the Confederate Army to invade Southern California, Terry was essentially enacting the 1859 PICO Act, which divided California into a free soil northern state and Southern California into a slave state. In the eyes of these Confederates, even as the rebellion came crumbling down back in Virginia and Georgia, in the Southwest, the rebellion could continue, and the Confederate States of America for a time would be Texas, Arizona, and Southern California. It didn't turn out that way, but we do have it on the record that Terry and the officers collaborating with them were raising troops for this purpose. By the end of 1863, he'd only managed to recruit enough men for one regiment because most Texas men were already in the army or they were dead. Hence, Terry authorized Robinson to go to Mexico and recruit from Confederate sympathizers in Chihuahua and Sonora. While in Chihuahua City, Robinson was reunited with his old comrade James Lucas, and the former territorial secretary returned to Texas with the former adjutant general in January of 1864. Robinson reported to Colonel Terry in San Antonio that he'd met hundreds of pro-Southern men who were willing to join the cause and retake Arizona and New Mexico for the Confederacy. Robinson even claimed he'd secured permission from Sonora Governor Ignacio Pesqueira for small groups of between 50 and 100 men to pass through Sonora on their expedition, but that larger groups might cause alarm among the Mexicans. After all, this was less than a decade after Henry Crabb's filibuster in Sonora. It's possible that what Robinson said about the governor is true, since Mexico was in its own civil war at the time, and the governor of Sonora always tried to maintain neutrality with the Americans. When the Confederates were still in Arizona, he allowed them to smuggle cotton to West Coast ports in Sonora, but he maintained diplomatic relations with the U.S., and U.S. ships still had access to the same ports the Confederates were using for their smuggling. His administration let the rebels do as they pleased as long as they didn't travel in sufficient numbers for filibustering. Confederate Colonel Rip Ford, who originally sent Baylor to claim New Mexico's separatist region for the CSA, supported this plan and he vouched for Robinson and Lucas's credibility and integrity to the War Department. In the spring of 1864, Robinson and Lucas returned into Mexico with money and a mission to recruit a regiment of Southerners and eventually march on Tucson. However, the Union had an active spy network gathering intelligence across northern Mexico. Some of them were military intelligence, others were Pinkerton men, and others were civilian expatriates who favored the Union cause. When Palatine Robinson arrived in Sonora's west coast port city of Gaimas on their recruiting mission, the U.S. Consul found out. The entire time Robinson was in Mexico, he was being watched by Union men. There were other Confederates working feverishly to take Arizona back for the South. Major Sherrod Hunter of the 2nd Texas Arizona had distinguished himself during the battles of 1863, especially for leading the amphibious attack on a fortified federal camp near Brashear City. In late 1863, he was redeployed to Galveston for coastal defense. Hunter caught the attention of Colonel David Terry, who brought the eager Arizona officer into his big plan to recruit and reconquer. In the spring of 1864, Sherrod Hunter was given virtual autonomy to appoint whatever officers and recruit whichever men he wanted as long as he reported to Terry as often as possible. Hunter set up his headquarters at Fort Duncan, an abandoned frontier post at Eagle Pass, 150 miles west of San Antonio and almost 500 miles east of Union-occupied El Paso. By September, Hunter had recruited one regiment of Texans, but this wasn't nearly enough for the task ahead of him. Meanwhile, back in Texas, the 4th Texas Arizona Cavalry finally got its baptism by fire in the summer of 1864. Spruce Baird resigned from the regiment, so command of the regiment passed to Lieutenant Colonel Dan Showalter, who was promoted to colonel. On June 25, 1864, 250 Texas Arizona cavalrymen attacked federal pickets at Rancho Las Rinas and drove them from the field. Losses were approximately 20 killed on each side. Then in July, the 4th Texas Arizona defeated Juan Cortina's pro-Union guerrillas at Rancho del Carmen. Because Cortina's men were Tejanos and Mexicans from the northern borderlands, 
They fought for the Union in the American Civil War, and they fought for Benito Juarez's Republican forces against the French. Cortina's troops crossed the border several times to fight in both ongoing wars. Then in August, Showalter's prestige grew further as men of the 4th Regiment captured the Union River gunboat USS Ark. However, the following month, Showalter's prestige turned to disgrace when his troops were defeated by Cortina's fighters at the First Battle of Palmito Ranch. Word got around that Showalter had been too drunk to lead his troops. Also in 1864, one of the officers that Sherrod Hunter recruited for the reconquest of Arizona was Lieutenant Henry Kennedy, an exiled Arizona miner in the 2nd Texas, Arizona. Wearing civilian clothes and operating undercover, the newly promoted Captain Kennedy left San Antonio for Mexico with the mission of recruiting men from California, Arizona, and New Mexico to reconquer Confederate Arizona and then move on to Southern California. Captain Kennedy arrived in San Francisco on July 14th. From there, he quietly worked his way to Stockton, then Sacramento, and then across the Sierras to Virginia City, Nevada. The Nevada Territory was a Union stronghold with two federal volunteer regiments and a pro-Union territorial militia. However, there were hundreds of miners in Virginia City and around those mountains who were either Confederate sympathizers who escaped military service in the East, or were among the thousands of ex-Confederate POWs who were paroled, but their parole was conditional upon them not going back south, nor going up to the north, but instead scattering and going west. That's why almost every frontier territory had a Virginia city. Many of these men in Nevada were highly interested in an expedition to retake Arizona. However, somebody informed on Kennedy, and he barely escaped capture in Virginia City. He hid out in the mountains until October, when the heat died down a little bit. Then Kennedy took a steamship to Mazatlan and finally reached the Texas border on January 19th with about 30 Southerners that he recruited in Mexico. However, he wasn't out of danger yet. Two days later, a band of armed men attacked Kennedy's camp in the middle of the night, killing seven rebel recruits, wounding seven more, and causing six others to flee back to Mexico. The attackers remain unknown. They could have been Federals, they could have been renegade gangs, which increasingly prowled the West Texas frontiers, sustaining themselves on violence, or they could have been Juan Cortina's pro-Union guerrillas. With their provisions stolen, the 13 surviving Confederates spent the next several days eating their horses. Then Captain Kennedy found out on his return to San Antonio in late January 1865 that the Confederacy had virtually collapsed during the 10 months he'd been gone. Late in January 1865, former Governor Lewis Owings chaired a meeting of like minds in San Antonio that included Colonel Daniel Showalter of the 4th Texas, Arizona, and Captain Henry Kennedy of Sherrod Hunter's regiment. They discussed strategies to reconquer their beloved territory out west, even as the Confederacy slowly burned down everywhere else. It was a wild dream, but the rebels still found reasons to hope. While the Confederate army was getting ground down and annihilated back east, the Arizona troops had just won a string of victories in the western and trans-Mississippi theaters of the war. Meanwhile, though the Federals controlled the Mississippi River and most of the state of Louisiana, the city of Shreveport in the northeastern part of the state remained a Confederate stronghold for the rest of the war. Some of the troops deployed in northern Louisiana were men of the Arizona Brigade. Ever the businessman, former Arizona Governor Owings went into business and trading consumer goods smuggled into Texas. As late as March 7th of 1865, with Lee's army still holding on in northern Virginia, Owings and his business partner B.R. Sappington were publishing newspaper ads hawking their goods for sale to buyers from Shreveport to San Antonio, who could pay in cotton or Confederate money. Finally, at the end of March 1865, when Jefferson Davis was desperate to keep the rebellion alive at any cost, the cashiered Colonel John R. Baylor was given his commission back and authorized to raise a regiment of rebel diehards to reinvade Arizona and New Mexico and continue the rebellion. Baylor, being classic Baylor, gave himself a field promotion to Brevet Brigadier General, although the army never recognized this. Unfortunately for him, only two weeks after he was allowed back into the army, Lee surrendered to Grant in Virginia. This paradigm shift on the East Coast kicked off a chain of surrenders across the South and Southwest, and accelerated the epidemic of mass desertions in units that hadn't yet surrendered. The invasion Baylor had dreamed of for three years never happened and he had to watch his last-ditch army disintegrate in front of him. 
He knew it was over when in Huntsville, Texas, he had to use his gun to stop a mutiny and riot brewing among the restless, demoralized troops. With his hand on his revolver, Baylor said, I'll be damned if you rob your state. I will protect her property. Himself demoralized, the old Indian fighter took his shattered dream back to his farm at the edge of Comanche country. As Baylor walked away from his brigade and dreams of redemption, the remnants of the 4th Texas Arizona disintegrated into literal banditry. Many of the regiment's men were deserters and draft dodgers, and many of them were recruited from the jails in the first place, so it's no surprise that when discipline broke down, the ruffians and criminals went back to being ruffians and criminals. They went roving through the West Texas countryside, preying on civilians with robbery, rape, and occasionally murder, resulting in other Confederate soldiers being deployed to hunt them down. In early May of 1865, the mighty 1st Texas Arizona Cavalry was whittled down to just 175 men. On May 15th, they disbanded at a camp on Sims Bayou near the Brazos River. Eleven days later, the 2nd Texas Arizona surrendered and was disbanded in Houston. While the men got to keep their sidearms and go home, George Baylor was under arrest for killing a fellow Confederate officer whom he blamed for their loss at Yellow Bayou. I guess the whole killing a guy thing just runs in the family. Also at the end of May, Major James Tevis, one of the original Arizona Guards from 1860, was in command of the last 15 men in the Arizona Scouts, which had once been Herbert's Arizona Cavalry Battalion. Another of those 15 men who had joined up with the Scouts was Colonel Dan Showalter of the 4th Texas Arizona. That's how few Arizona men were left in the disintegrated Arizona Brigade. And so the last of the Scouts reluctantly mustered out. Once the shattered remnant of the Arizona Scouts disbanded, the last legal claims to or living traces of Confederate Arizona, stretching from the Rio Grande to the Colorado River, were gone. Major Tevis recalled, My command was the last to be mustered out at Hempstead, Texas. I proceeded to San Antonio and my men, some 15 of them, scattered in all directions, and only three of them ever arrived at Mesilla. As for the rest of the Arizona soldiers, Texas and Arizonans, those who were ready to go home took the loyalty oath and were paroled. Those who refused to take the oath of allegiance to the Union left the country, exiled by the advancing Federal Army for the second time in three years. Colonel Dan Showalter went to Mazatlan and ran a cantina, but he died a year later from tetanus that he got from getting cut in a bar fight. The former militia captain, congressman, and Arizona cavalry officer Granville Ulrey went to Sonora with his wife. Sarah Malvina Ulrey kept a diary of her journey south from Texas and her time in Mexico, and you can hear more about that in our video on five Wild West Civil War diaries. The ex-Confederate congressman Marcus McWilly went to the mountains of Chihuahua to work and manage gold and silver mines. Lieutenant Colonel Alonzo Ridley used his Confederate engineer training and traveled across Mexico building railroads for the Mexican government. Peter Hardiman, commander of the 1st Texas Arizona, took his family to Brazil where he spent the rest of his life. His descendants are among Los Confederados. Major James Tevis of the Arizona Cavalry was paroled and he went to St. Louis. His memoir, Arizona in the 50s, was eventually adapted into a miniseries by Disney in the 1960s. John Baylor and Dr. Lewis Owings spent the rest of their lives in Texas, going back and forth between ventures in business and local politics. John Baylor would later kill another guy and get away with it. Former Lieutenant Governor Ignacio Orantia, long sour on the Confederacy since Baylor overthrew him in 1861, emerged from the war as a staunch Republican. He was even elected to the New Mexico legislature in the fall of 1865, as if he'd never participated in the government that seceded from the Union. Ignacio Orantia remains the only lieutenant governor in the history of Arizona. After the war between the states and territories, the ex-Secretary of Confederate Arizona, Robert Jocelyn, wrote these words in a poem lamenting the loss of the war, as well as the South's political and cultural identity. And Summoner, imbecile for aught but evil, now plays the Puritan, and now the devil. If more you ask, the contrast to complete. Behold, a Negro in Davis's seat. That verse by the former Secretary of the Arizona Territory speaks for itself. Jocelyn's 1875 poem, A Satire on the Times, is his attempt at a poetic manifesto against Reconstruction and Emancipation. The lines you just heard don't pine over the loss of states' rights, but specifically complain that, 
Thanks to evil northern politicians, Jocelyn's home state of Mississippi elected a black senator during Reconstruction, that being Hiram Rhodes Revels. For men like Jeff Davis and Robert Jocelyn and Louis Owings and John Baylor, the dream of a Confederate Arizona stretching from the Colorado River to the Rio Grande with slavery and King Cotton having a gateway to the Pacific was over. The Stars and Stripes have flown over Arizona ever since, with Tucson permanently in Arizona and Mesilla permanently in New Mexico. However, the Apache Wars continued for 21 years after the Civil War ended, with Geronimo's men being the last to surrender. And as for the former Arizona militiaman, an Arizona cavalry soldier, and ex-Confederate turned Yankee scout, Jack Swilling, after the war he scouted for the Federal Cavalry in the Apache Wars. Then he did a couple of things in search of making a quick buck on the side that ultimately had a huge impact on Arizona. In 1867, he started the Swilling Irrigation and Canal Company and dug Swilling Ditch, a waterway in the desert that became part of the Tempe Canal, one of the oldest canals still in use today in Arizona's Salt River Project. Swilling and the people in business with him also co-founded the town of Phoenix inside Arizona's modern borders. Today, Phoenix is the most populated city in the state of Arizona and the fifth most populated city in the United States. Well done, Jack. Thus ends the story of the Confederate territory of Arizona. However, that was not the whole story of Arizona in the American Civil War. When General Carleton occupied Confederate Arizona in the summer of 1862, the Apache Wars were still raging. Pro-Confederate bushwhackers attacked federal occupation troops. The U.S. Congress had to organize a new Arizona Territory. Then there were territorial elections, not to mention the formation of the Territorial Militia and the Federal 1st Arizona Infantry Regiment. These are all their own incredible stories in the pantheon of Arizona history. All of these remarkable true stories will be told in the sequel to this film, The Union Territory of Arizona. That one covers Arizona for the rest of the Civil War and during Reconstruction, which is when many Arizona Confederates start to come home from exile. And bullets will fly. This month we're celebrating this channel's first anniversary on YouTube. I'm glad you're here to celebrate with me. On this occasion, I have some very special announcements. In 2023, you'll get documentaries on the New Mexico Militia in the Civil War, Stan Wadey's military campaigns in the Indian Territory, Juan Cortina's guerrilla war against the Confederacy, and Captain Ingram's entire guerrilla war in Northern California against the Union. All of these are awesome stories you won't want to miss. Also, there will be a mini-series on California politicians and public officials who defected to the Confederacy. <laughs> there were a lot. And on the naval war in the Pacific. We'll conclude our discussion on Hispanic Confederates, and our series on the hard evidence for black confederates will now be expanded from three parts to five, including coverage of confederate body servants in the New Mexico campaign. Confederate sympathizers, this is your trigger warning. But there's other great news. In January, you'll be able to treat yourself with the companion book for this film, which includes details on Jeb Stewart's special connection to confederate Arizona, and more on Reconstruction, when Civil War veterans fought each other again in the Range Wars. It'll be available as an ebook for a steep, expensive, sky-high price of 99 cents. Then, once this channel reaches 1,000 YouTube subscribers, I'll release the companion book to this whole series, The Civil War in the Wild West. It'll contain an expanded edition of the Confederate Territory of Arizona, with facts and stories that didn't make it into the film or the ebook, including more battles. And of course, the book contains coverage of the war in California, the Pacific Northwest, New Mexico and Utah, Texas, the Indian Territory, and the great Native American uprisings from Dakota to the Pacific Coast. The Civil War in the Wild West will be a physical book that you can hold in your hands and sniff the pages for that awesome new book smell. And so, dear viewer, thank you so much for watching the Civil War Wild West Edition. Consider all of these incredible true stories to be your share of long buried treasure. The Lost Confederate Gold is right here, folks.